Uh, A.R. Rosner heads up the Prime Minister's Fuel Choices Initiative, and uh, I'd like to invite him up on stage now to uh, tell us about the plan and uh, how they're going to put it into action. Ladies and gentlemen, A.R. Rosner. Well, first of all, I have to say thank you for everybody coming. It's, it's really exciting to see you all here, um, and we welcome you. And what I'll try to do in the next 20 minutes is just try to explain the way we've tried to structure this program and how we can think we can take it forward. So we got a mission which basically say, basically, in a nutshell, let's change the world, okay? Let's do something that will be so dramatic that will actually catalyze the world in a way that not only for Israel, but for the entire world. And obviously, you know, we're going to use what we have and the first thought was how we're going to address it. So obviously there are what we call two ways. You can you know, start the normal linear way, but you could also start by you know, building all sorts of mechanisms that will allow what we try to call it non-linear approach. Um, so what I'll try to, to do here is to show you a little bit of the thoughts that we put behind and how we are trying to tackle both. Um, there were a few basic assumptions that we put when we first started. The first one was the, the economic viability of the solution. Obviously, we saw what's happened in the, in, the, um, in the solar market, where once the subsidies uh, stopped, the market pretty much collapsed. And we want to avoid it, because eventually, you know, government won't be able to subsidize everything for too long. We need economic uh, solution. The other very important point was that it has to be environmentally better. And now, there are discussions, you know, whether it's 20% better, 30% better, 70% better. We're not going to get into that now, but we, won't have, we want to have a better solution. Now, what you see in this chart is basically the uh, air pollution quality, what's called NOx emission, what actually we inhale on a daily basis from, came out of our cars. That's in Tel Aviv during Yom Kippur, which is a holiday. Nobody drives their car in that day. And what you see is very basic. When there are no cars, there is no pollution. Very simple. So I wonder if we can get that someday, because I, my office is on the main street in Tel Aviv, and I keep closing the, the windows all the time because of that. Anyway, so that's the second uh, assumption that we put. And the third one was the fact that it's not our goal to pick a winner and decide which technology will be the best. And it's our goal to uh, enable everybody and to kind of, let's say, and be the enabler for the market to decide for itself. And obviously, as a government, there are some tools that we can do, especially on the bootstrap of, of new uh, infrastructure. Um, so what we have done afterwards is try to kind of analyze what the market has to offer. And let me try to elaborate a little bit on this chart, because what you see is a different technology, and not only the, the name of the technology, which on the left-hand side, I wonder if I'm, if, where I should, oh, sorry. I've done something wrong. Yeah, here it is. Um, but also, we've tried to analyze when each of these technology will be available to the market on economic terms. Now, obviously, there are some shiftings. Some countries are a little bit different. And again, this is it's not our uh, way of looking at the world. It's try, just try to figure out whether or not there are technologies available or, and what we can do about that. And, and the results are basically there are three groups of technologies, one around and natural gas, the other around electric mobility, and the third one is around uh, biofuels. And what you can see that over the years we anticipate, and maybe we will be wrong, maybe you know, some of the technology will come to the market faster than we anticipate, but at the end of the day there are many solutions. And this is very important, and some of them are already available now, which is even more important. Uh, so the reality is that we have solutions, some of these solutions available now, and obviously there are kind of a local bias. You know, we just heard about ethanol in Brazil. We know the, we have a, a large delegation of, of Chinese officials here, and they, they produce uh, methanol from coal. We have countries like Sweden with a huge forestry business. And so there are many, many uh, uh, approach, local approach, and, you know, everything is good in that respect. And also, we can implement the technologies now, which is very important because one of the most problematic things in, in what we have done over the years in that respect is that we always promise the holy grail sometimes in the next 15, 20 years. But we want to start now, because once we start the change, then everything will look different. We need to have a quick wins at the end of the day. So 
we start to analyze and try to think what are the barriers for change? I mean, how come we, will, we never make the change? I mean, it's not a, we are not the first one to try to solve this problem, right? And, and we've kind of tried to build a, what we call accept, acceptability index, which means let's try to bring together all the elements that prevent technology coming into the market, whether it's a infrastructure, whether it's the total cost of ownership, whether it's just the acceptability because the market don't like it or like it, whatever. And we've tried to build this kind of index uh, and try to uh, analyze the transportation sector from different segments. So we've took the, 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 the different segments of the, of the car, of the, of the transportation industry, and we've kind of uh, built each one of these technology uh, based on what we've thought it's, the, it's uh, appropriate for it. So for example, if you look at the CNG, for example, it probably make more sense to adopt it on a heavy duty vehicles rather than a f normal fleet because you need less infrastructure, usually bus companies or, or large fleet of trucks, they can, uh, they can use uh, one center for, for refueling and also they, do, uh, they consume much more oil than just you know, private cars. Uh, so we have done it for all the different uh, technologies. For example, you can see the, the electric mobility which is at some areas become almost par with oil, and some are not. Uh, you can see the methanol, which is, seems to be a very good solution for privates because um, you can use the current infrastructure and because it's going to be cheaper. Um, and obviously the last one is biofuel, which at the moment is not, is not fully competitive, uh, but in some areas, like for example in airplanes, this is the only solution out there. So um, looking at this chart, which I know could be a little bit confusing, um, we've tried to kind of mark where we should try to help the market help himself, basically. Uh, and what you see is that, as I said, some uh, segments have some technology which are relevant for them. Um, so we come up with this, you know, kind of chart, which again, it's not 100% it's not, uh, uh, scientific, but the idea is that we believe that in these specific segments, this technology can, can prevail because they're economically better and because the acceptability could be much higher. And we like to help them all. We have, you know, not necessarily the fact that we had only one fuel in the past means that we will have one fuel in the future. We can have more than that. And that is exactly what we try to do here is basically help everybody in what, what they need. Um, so, I just want to show you, for just this, as a short example, you don't have to look at all the numbers in the chart, but just look at this, these two numbers. Basically, what you see is about three, three and a half percent of the vehicles in Israel actually consume about 24 percent of the, of the fuel. So if you can provide the, the car, the, the, obviously the regulation, but also the infrastructure for these three percent, you can have a major influence on the consumption of oil. And this is exactly our plan. We're going to provide them with the, with the optionality. They won't have to choose, but the, this optionality means that they will have cheaper solution. So this is just one example. Obviously we have more, but I don't want to run through everything that we have there. But th this is the idea. Let's provide the solutions to whoever can use it in a proper way, and he will make money out of it, and we will have the other type of fuels available. And from this chart, what we plan to do is try to implement methanol in a private vehicle and CNG in the heavy duty and et cetera. So we have a few tools that we can use. Obviously pilots is one of them. We already have more than 10 pilots, different types, whether it's electric bus, methanol cars, all sorts of different types of technology because in the end of the day in transportation, you know, you have to use the, the, the vehicle to see how it's actually working, which is very important. The other part is obviously the standardization, which is essential to, to, to make it happen. And in that respect, the discussion earlier was very important because there are ways to work together globally to kind of work together on regulation and to see what we can do in order to enhance this process. The, the third point which is very important is tax or subsidies or um, what we can do in that respect. This fiscal tool is very powerful. In Israel, for example, we have a tax regime which is in favor for cars who are cleaners. 
So if you, if you drive an electric car, you pay 8% uh, tax on your car. If you drive one of these heavy SUVs that consume a lot of oil and, and very dirty, you will pay 90%. And you got everything in between. So the idea is that in addition to, to the fact that the cars have incentives to go cleaner, we are putting another uh, layers of, of, uh, of tax on the gasoline itself. On average, gasoline tax in Israel is 100%. What we will do is we have difference. So, for example, natural gas as a cleaner, as a safer fuel, will have lower tax than gasoline. And, and hopefully by then we'll create additional fiscal incentive to the public to consume um, what we believe is a safer fuel. And of course, the infrastructure and here what we do, again, we'll, we eventually we'll let the market uh, decide and do the most of the work, but we are trying to help at least at the beginning on the bootstrap level um, so we can um, kind of make the whole thing start. Um, this is how we see, uh, again, this is not mandatory, of course. This is what we anticipate if we do the right thing on the right time. We see a large penetration of natural gas-based solutions, uh, obviously followed by uh, electric, uh, electric solutions and biofuels. What you do see is that in the long term, we believe that we'll see more and more cleaner solutions that will uh, overcome and become cheaper and, and hopefully more accessible. Um, this is also creates great contribution for our economy. And by the calculation that we've made, if we'll succeed, we actually gain about one percentage point to the GDP on a yearly basis, which is obviously phenomenal and helps a lot when you come to the government with all sorts of ideas and, and you know, investments and you show them that the results are very, very good. Okay, so now go a little bit. We have a couple of more minutes to talk about what I call it the non-linear approach, which means that in addition to pushing what we already have, we need to think maybe a little bit different outside of the box and see what we can do uh, in order to um, bring new technologies, new ideas out there. And what we try to do is basically build a funnel. The funnel starts with the very basic research, goes to uh, industrial R&D pilots, a lot of support in startups. You see some of it outside today. Uh, and all the way to commercialization of the product. And we have certain tools that works with each one of these uh, layers, I would say. And obviously, we believe and we are trying hard to combine it with international collaboration with other countries. There's a lot of knowledge out there. And hopefully, we'll be able to align everybody together. Um, some of the tools, just for you to kind of grasp, we have, uh, I would uh, divide it to the financial tools and the non-financial tools, which is basically how we can support uh, whether it's entrepreneurs or companies, regulation and everything. What you see outside is what part of, part of our, what we call eco-motion community, which is basically uh, let's help entrepreneurship in Israel move to a new field, which they never, we never had before, a car industry. Um, and this is actually amazing to see how quickly people are moving from one field to another once they see there's a good, uh, you know, first of all, good reason and obviously money, which is important. But we also support them in other ways. We do the right connections with international bodies, etc., and that is very important. Also, we have all sorts of uh, uh, grants for the small companies, for large companies. We, we, we put up a $100 million co-invest fund. Uh, and all of it together should have some kind of an ecosystem which will help uh, crazy as, as possible idea to come to the market and we try to be as plural and as open as possible for every you know, type of idea or technology that come out there and we are willing to test them, we are willing to invest as long as there is someone that comes along with us. Because again, this is not our job to decide whether it's a good solution or a bad solution. It's our job to create the environment to make it happen. That's it. Thank you very much. Question? Uh, Eyal, since you've uh, finished with a full five minutes to spare, which is very, very un-Israeli of you, uh, just a couple of uh, questions. Uh, Professor Kendall, unless I misheard him, and uh, he or one of his people, correct me if I did, suggested, I think, that CNG, compressed natural gas, wasn't, had a problem for Israel because of uh, security concerns, I'm guessing, because uh, the tank could explode more easily, perhaps, more than a normal car. Does that... 
Uh, if I understood correct, that that is the case uh, correctly, does that reduce the viability of that as a fuel? Because you had it quite prominent in one of your slides just before. Yes. Um, well, we hope that we'll be able to solve it. Um, this is something that we try to learn from outside, from other countries. And what we've realized is that nobody actually tries to put a bomb under a bus of natural gas just as an experiment. So we do, we're going to do it. And hopefully afterwards, uh, based on our analysis and calculation, we think we'll be able to uh, overcome this problem and, and let you know, heavy duty trucks. So heavy duty trucks has no problem at the moment to start. But we are talking mainly about buses and, and public transportation. We believe we're going to overcome that. Okay. And, and my other question from, from what you said before about the taxes on cars. Now, yes. anyone who lives here in Israel knows that cars here are about double the price of elsewhere, well, certainly many tens of percentage points yeah. more expensive. The average is 70%, by the way. All right, 70% average. And you think you said electric cars have just an 8% 8%, tax? correct. I don't see, I mean, all things being equal, you'd expect to see almost all new cars being electric because that no. would mean that they'd be more or less the same price given the tax differential. Not so really, because even now, with the net percent tax, the price of electric car is higher. That much higher. Plug-in high fuel is 20%, plug-in hybrid, sorry, hybrid is 30%. Still, within this uh, tax environment, the price of plug-in is a bit more expensive than a normal car. So the buyers are the ones who are in, in either the heavy users, uh, which is, again, uh, important. But what we are trying, there's also a lot of, as I said, there is a market acceptance to this. Because what you see, there's a lot of uh, people who still wait to see that this technology is available or valid or whatever. And we believe that over time, it will become more and more accessible. And the price of batteries is coming down, which is, again, very important to, to the whole ecosystem of electric mobility. No, no, thanks, I have one question. Uh, I think it's probably our last one. Uh, it strikes me that for the economic viability of electric vehicles, you need uh, lower priced or as low priced electricity as you can, as you can get. Uh, how soon, uh, how critical is EV uh, distribution in Israel? How much is that contingent on this whole natural gas boom resulting in lower electricity prices for consumers? And how can you expedite that? Well, obviously, um, it's still, well, when you talk about electric cars, we, we're still not there. I wish we were, but we're still not there in terms of, of the cost, of the total cost of ownership. If you take the, the costs of the car, if you take the fact that people still have the range anxiety and everything that relates to that. Uh, so there, there are, you know, a small group of people willing to take the risks, but most of the people still don't. Uh, natural gas obviously reduced the cost of the electricity, but the electricity, the, 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 let's say the, the refueling of electrics in electric car, you know, is still a marginal part of the, of the total equation, which is the, to the cost of the car, the infrastructure, the range anxiety, and everything else. Uh, and since we still have a minute and a half left, I'm just going to throw one more. So, so given that the, the, the price of electric, I mean, in, in the UK and other European countries, there's a bit of a subsidy. You might get, say, for example, 5,000 pounds off a Nissan Leaf. So it's a little bit more uh, in tune with normal uh, com internal combustion engine cars. Is the Israeli government considering, perhaps, as that being a means to get more lower polluting vehicles, electric vehicles on the road, to make them well, first competitive? Of all, first of all, by, by, by building such a tax regime, you are pushing. You are giving this $5,000, basically, because you just take lower tax. Instead of a normal car, which pays 70% tax, you take only 8%. So that's a lot of money. It's just the other way around, the same equation. Uh, but what we are trying to do now is build the infrastructure around. So we'll have enough. Uh, you know, stations to basically charge your car, uh, everything that relates to... There's a lot of regulation which never been, you know, nobody thought about electric car 30 years ago when they done all the regulation around housing and where you can put just, you know, the, the charging station, stuff like that. So there's, in addition to the price of the car and the fact that people need to... Add, look about Tesla. Tesla is more expensive. People still buy it because they like the chic of it and they like the fact that it's clean and whatever it's come to. It's a package. But, but people who drive Tesla have a lesser fear of range anxiety, which they have on a normal leaf or whatever. So I think that over time we will overcome that, but it's going to take a while. I think they also have low range anxiety because I think the, uh, the, new, uh, the, the new model has uh, about 400 uh, kilometers or something range or 400 yeah. mile range. Uh, but we'll hear from one company tomorrow that uh, hopes to resolve that. But for now, just want to thank uh, Al Rosner for thank that you. very informative talk, Al Rosner.